I hope that you guys will have the opportunity to run a large recording session. So let me show you what that's like. Um, I recorded the uh, Special Olympics World Game theme in uh, December of 2015 at what's now the power station at Berkeley. It was called Avatar at that time, and it was originally the power station. And if anybody knows why the name power station, because it used to be a Con Edison power station, you know, in the 60s and earlier. The most important piece of information I can give you is something that if you've taken classes with me before, you've heard me say more than once. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. The most successful recording sessions have the most preparation. And preparation happens on many levels. So we're going to go through that right now. And uh, let's see how much time we have at the end. Uh, this may be it. And then we'll save the third part for next. That I was going to do today for next week. I write this theme song. I write a demo. It's all MIDI. ESPN loves it. And then we want to record it. They have to, we have to figure out what's possible. So what's possible is based upon several factors. The first factor being what sounds good in the track now that we don't have to replace. And the second factor being what's their budget and what can I do for that budget? I had a budget of about $10,000 to record the band. After listening to the session, the, the track, the most important part of the track that needed to sound the best was the brass because it's a, fa it's a fanfare and there's the brass is the most important part of the track. Everything else could be my samples and my guitar playing and that would be fine. I wanted this to sound big. There are some techniques in the studio that you can do that you can't do live, like I triple tracked the brass. So I had 19 brass players or 18 brass players. So it ended up being 18 times three. How does this work? Things don't just magically happen. I made a rough score. I handed it off to a professional engraver to make professional looking score. For me to sit there in, in Sibelius and dick around while I've got other things to do, because it was a big job. I had other music to write. I, I was balancing like, I had to write like 30 tracks. I had to score about 10 short films and I had to produce this theme song. So if I was going to waste three days putting together the um, the, the, the sheets, that, that, that that's ridiculous. I could finish finish so much other stuff in three or four days that and that I find more enjoyable and I had the money. So I hired somebody I grew up with who's a professional engraver, Phil Thomas. He lives up in Vermont. He made me professional. I didn't have to worry about anything. I could just tell him what I wanted. I got it back and looked at it and goes, beautiful. No errors, no mistakes, no nothing at the session. It worked. So that's something that's, I know these graduate students, you all are, are creating scores and everything, but when you're under pressure, you're sort of like the head of the music department in addition to being the composer. So you have to learn how to delegate things. That's one thing I learned when I was music directing a show is I had to delegate. Sometimes I couldn't, I had to sit out in the house and watch the show. So I'd have to delegate the piano, the conducting of the show to a substitute for that day. Or if I needed to listen while people were at rehearsals, I would delegate out a, an, uh, another musician to come and play the piano at the rehearsal so that I could pay attention to what was going on and not just sit there and play the piano. So learning how to delegate out different responsibilities to different people. To be frankly honest, Phil is a better, better at notation than I am. I am a composer and I sequence, right? That's where my strength is. I can certainly use notation software, but it's, pedant it's ped pendulous, pedantic, plodding, putrid. <laughs> I could go on with the piece. I could alliterate into heaven. Um, I don't like using, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not fun. It's, it's, it's dull work for me. Then how do the musicians show up? Do I just make phone calls? No, I delegate out. I call a contractor. So for those of you that don't know, if you want to get hired for any kind of work in the city that's professional work, when I got hired to play with the New York Pops at Carnegie Hall, the contractor called me up. When I got hired to play Miss Saigon, the contractor made the final call. I knew the conductor and the music director and the music supervisor and the contractor, but they got together and made the list and then the contractor made the call and did the hiring. So I worked with my friend Tony, who's, I sent him a copy of the chart and I had some questions about whether a few things I wrote were okay to play on the trumpet. So I sent him my rough score and he said, yeah, that's not a problem. It's always good to check with real musicians and not just rely on what you can play on your samples. And then we talked about the kind of music and I had uh, a few people that I wanted to hire. I wanted to hire a couple of my Queens College classmates. 
to play bass trombone and trombone. So I told him. And then I had a friend of mine from Boston that I wanted to play the, one of the trumpet parts. So we, we got him down for a day. He wanted to visit his daughter who was going to Columbia. So he came down and spent the day with his daughter and then spent the next day working. I just had a few people I wanted in there. And then I said, you do the rest. And the other thing you need to do is if you're going to run a big session like this, have food for the musicians. I had two of my students, Valentina and Jonathan, they were undergraduate music majors. I had them assist me on the session. The day before the session started, I went down to a bagel place on uh, 8th Avenue and uh, 54th Street, I think it is. I made a big order. I sent Jonathan and Valentina to go get that stuff and set it up outside so that there was food there, drinks, coffee, water for the musicians. They're fed. They walk in, they see a spread. You know, they could schmooze, they can have a cup of coffee, some water. If they're hungry, they can have it, right? All the food went. Musicians like to eat. We hired the band, but then there's a lot of other things you have to do. You got to realize that if there's any mistakes, I'm spending like $100 a minute. So if there's something that takes me 10 minutes to fix, that's $1,000 down the crapper. More preparation. So let's take a look at some stuff here. This is my diary. This is my run of session. So if you're going to do a rehearsal for a Broadway show, you have a script of how the rehearsal is going to go. Run of session, 12, 26, 14. So this is 2014, not 2015. Engineer arrive and the setup start, 12 o'clock. Musicians arrive, get paperwork done. And they had paper, things they had to sign and everything. And then 12.30 to 1, rehearse musicians in place. So I uh, sit to for full ensemble sections. And then Ken will fine tune the sound. And then from 1 p.m. to 1.30, record 2D bits, all double tracked. So I double tracked, not triple tracked. I've got measure numbers, a layout of the studio. This is before we do anything, right? So this is the conductor podium. This is the tree, the Deca tree mic above the conductor. Then these are the outrigger mics. These are the trumpet mics. The black rings are the, tr are the microphones, trombones. Right, so three trombones and three bass trombones. There you go, right there. French horns, we got mics in the back. I think we ended up moving those mics and putting them in the front or adding two mics in the front uh, because I, I sometimes don't like mics in back. And then the tuba. All right. So that's the microphone setup. Then um, this is the mic. Imp this is the microphones. So we even picked the microphones, right? Uh, main stereo right, main stereo left, C24. That is an AKG microphone. Looks like this. It's a stereo microphone. Then we have these Omnis. These are, these are the two that are above the conductor's head. Then we have two Omni mics, which are these uh, uh, Audio-Technica 406s. Oh, DPA 406s. These are small condenser microphones. These are like audiophile quality microphones. That last one was a vintage mic, right? Then there's something called a coffin. And when I show you pictures of the session, uh, uh, Avatar is uh, the, the power station, the big room there, they've got many rooms, is like a dome, right? And, and it's got incredible acoustics. And at the top of the dome, there's like a little cupola kind of cut out at the top, and they call that the coffin. So they had up in the coffin, um, they had uh, two Neumann K86, KM86 is these vintage microphones up there. We didn't end up using those, it, it sounded like crap. Then the French horn, we had a pair of these Neumanns right here. Uh, we have these in the college. We use these. They're newer microphones. And then for the bones, we had Coles. And these are um, ribbon microphones, the 4038. You'll see these on brass all the time. These are great microphones. And on the bass trombones, we had these big old RCA 77s, two of them on the bass trombones, right? It's kind of cool. Then on the tuba, we had this uh, 40, U47 FET mic, another Neumann mic. And in the trumpet, we use these biodynamic ribbon mics. And these are great for spot mics because ribbon mics typically have a figure eight pattern, which means they pick up in front and in back. Well, these are hypercardioid, meaning they only pick up 
in front. So they reject all the other sounds, so there's very little bleed in it. And plus, they're ribbon mics, which means they sound very smooth on the high frequency. So we pick the microphones. And that's Ken, my friend Ken in the studio, engineering. There's another shot. This is a big Neve console. We, we didn't really use, we only use these for the mic preamps. We didn't use any of the EQ on this. Everything just went straight from the console into Pro Tools. And this is one of the assistants that worked there. And this is my friend Steve Vaviakis, uh, another great audio engineer and mixer. He was there as a, another pair of ears. This is the session. This is my friend Sherry. Ush, and these are the musicians set up. And then this guy right here, this is the guy from ESPN. And these are my friends Nancy and Lisa and Amanda, their associate, the filmmakers that were uh, producing the entire project. And this is during rehearsal. And we'll take a look at the microphone set up in a second. There's another picture of Sherry. Okay, so I'll tell you something, right? They wanted to be on the recording. So I'm conducting them. She's playing a tambourine and she's playing clavinet, claves, right? So I got them to play two measures correctly and then I just pasted it in. So they're actually on the track. <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? All right, so let's take a look here. So this is from the control room looking out this is Ken, and this is one of their assistants. And so here's those stereo mic above the conductor's head, right? That's set up coincident. And then the, here's those uh, DPA mics right here, and right here, the, they're called outriggers. And then you could see these black mics right here. These are the coals. This is the buyer dynamic mic. This is those big RCA ribbons, right? These two for the bass trombones. This is that uh, FET 47. And then the French horn mics are back there. You can't really see them. And then there's a talk back mic for the conductor. Like it's an AKG 414 right there, an old one too. There you go. You can really get a good sense of it. Yeah, okay, so we've seen all these, right? The upshot of the thing is that I spent a certain amount of time writing and arranging the track. I spent just as much time, if not more, getting ready for the session. And it went smoothly. There were no problems. There was not, nothing. It, it ran like the clockwork. It was We were done early. Uh, the players were unbelievably great. Some of the best music. You know, I mean, ser seriously. Freelancers in New York, Los Angeles, Nashville, these are like some of the best musicians in the world at what they do, people that do these recording sessions. They're unbelievably, they read, they can play different styles, they can sight read, and it sounds like they've been playing it for weeks and months. And, you know, it's just like an honor to be in the room with these people and to have them be my co be colleagues with you. So, um, it just, but preparation and taking care of that. So, you know, if you are going to be fortunate enough at some point to get a budget to have a session, delegate and prepare, right? And get get the right people in the job that you delegate out to. Don't hire, I hire friends, but I hire friends that have track records that I know I can trust. I knew I could trust Tony to get the right musicians. I knew I could trust Ken to get the right sounds and, um, I knew I could trust Phil to make a score that I wouldn't have to proofread, even though I did proofread it. <laughs> but that's another story. So let's uh, take, I don't know, have I played you guys this track? So we'll talk just a little bit more about this. So then uh, I want to talk to you guys about writing a theme package, but I'll, I'm going to save that for next week. But we'll just, let me just play you this um, bit. So this is the entire track, right?
Okay, you got the gist of that. So when you do these themes packages, you have a, d a bunch of deliverables, right? So that's the full bit. Then there's something they call the Hallmark Open, right? Which is this track here. So let's play that. Got my mnemonic at the end. Ba -da -ba -ba -da. This is the uh, 30 second bump promo. That's this track here. Right, so it's just the same thing, but for 30 seconds. Then there's the two minute vamp, which is this here. So you give them all this material and then they can sprinkle it about as they see fit. And they gave me a list of deliverables. Uh, they knew what they wanted. And this is where knowing how to do edits and, and stuff like that will really help. Then there's the two minute, then there's the uh, 60 second billboard. That's this one here. Let's see what this is. Welcome to the Special Olympic Games. I'm your host, Joe Blow, and today we've seen so-and-so do this, that, and the other thing. Let's take it into the studio, right? So that's, you know, I've got the open button. And then, uh, let's see. Then you have to do some stingers. Going into commercial. A little different. So, yeah. All right. Next week, we'll start looking at all these, rest of these, and I could talk about them. How do you know what all of those terms were, like, you know, like the 60 second thing or the two minute vamp? How do you know which sections to cut out? Exper well, what's the most important? What's the most important thing? Right. That da 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 ba da da. It's got a groove to it. They can cut the picture to it. You know that fanfare they, 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 at the beginning. That's for other situations. I did make a mix of that for them. They used it for certain things, but they wanted that. They, they'll also tell you. You can have a discussion with them as to like what they want as the most important bits. You know, but you should have a good idea of what you think it should be and basically the main melody, right? And you have to make, you have to just practice doing edits and different arrangements. That's part of this gig. I, I, I don't know how I can explain to you. Like, if something is a 30 second bit, it should sound like a complete piece. It shouldn't sound like an edit. So let's, all right, that's a good question. So, and I will get into that more next week. Um, open one more time. That's so that for me, that sounded like a complete piece, right? The other thing too, is that as you do these things, you compose with that in mind that you're going to have to do cut downs. You know, that's part of your composition process. You have to understand, you know, and when you're writing, you're going, okay, so how many seconds is that for that complete iteration of the theme? That's 15 seconds. Great. Cause then I can make a third, that's 12 seconds. That's great. Cause then I can make a 30 with a little bit of a beginning and a little bit of a button at the end. Right. So you start to, you construct your work in a way that makes it easier to, com to make these different arrangements.
you know this stinger right here it just it need you it's just it's basically just the the button just to get into a commercial ba -da -ba -ba -da. you know they're talking they're talking and we'll be back after this uh, announcement from the, our sponsor or so and so and then you know while that's there there's a graphic that comes up and then it fa fades it does a cross dissolve into the commercial or the spot that they're going into. You know, so that's... it's very similar to like the trailer industry, you know, like how they, it's like a formula? Kind of? Yeah, it's it's a formula, but it's not a formula. You know, it's, it. you know what I mean? It's a formula in terms of that uh, all great themes have a mnemonic. Um, they have an idea like... Uh, Like when you hear that, that is FIFA World Cup on Fox. It's got a recognizable melody that's a mnemonic, a hook, something that it helps to brand. And I'm going to talk about that all next week. So um, stay tuned. All right. Have a nice Thanksgiving, everyone. Um, I hope that you all you, you you all have a healthy day and nobody gets um, holiday COVID. Seriously, it's a thing. You guys all take care of yourselves, and I will see you next week. Please have your first drafts ready next week. If you haven't started composing yet, you're going to be in trouble. So get get on that. Don't wait until uh, next Tuesday night. I'll catch you guys later. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great day tomorrow. Thanks, Professor. Good night. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good Thanksgiving. Catch you later.